Uh, let us pray. Oh, the children head out now, right? So as the... Well, it's that way. <laughs> so as they head out, uh, there is a story about two, uh, two preachers who were discussing what was the best way to preach. Now, if, if you're somebody who watches a lot of preaching, you find out that there's more than one way. They've taught different ways to do sermons over the years. And for a long time, it was very popular, three points and a poem. Have you heard that sermon? Three points and then a poem, three points and a poem. They do it every week. And the newer kind that came out was uh, storytelling. Well, these two preachers were arguing storytelling, you know, three points in a poem, and they were going back and forth. They heard a, a famous preaching professor was in town, and so they went to hear him speak, and, and they said, you know what, we'll settle this, we'll ask him, how many points should a sermon have? So he, he finished speaking, and one of, one of them stood up and said, how many, sir, how, how many points should a sermon have? And he thought about it for a moment, and he goes, at least one. Have I told that one here before? <laughs> if I start it next time, y'all go, we've heard that one. So, oh, I should pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Uh, definitely before I get ahead of myself. So what is the point? Uh, I'm going to start this sermon with what the point is. Uh, what is the point of worship, Bible study, service, accountability, uh, of all of this, of the rules of the church? The point of it. Uh, I'm going to present that I believe that this is the point. So that we may be drawn close to God. That is the point. So that we are drawn to walk in a journey with God and that that journey end with God. That is the place that we are going. And so the Apostles' Creed, I call it guardrails uh, that keep you out of the ditch. Uh, scripture, scripture, while I hold a very high view of Scripture, it is not God. God is God. It leads us to God. Prayer, what does it do? It allows us to talk. All of these are leading us to God. The important part about all this is where it takes us is to a place of being in the presence of God. We just finished up a, a very short study of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. It is a book that C.S. Lewis wrote in rebuttal to this particular idea, that in the end, everything rolls together and becomes with God. What was being presented was that all roads, like all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to God. And, and C.S. Lowe said, no, in the end they don't. Those that don't lead to truth, those that don't lead to reality, do not lead to God. That in the end, when we end up in heaven, we will end up in the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God, the fullness of, of the Holy Spirit. And only truth... And only light will exist, exist there. And so if we insist on taking something that isn't truth with us, we can't go. Only truth and reality in its fullness is present before God. Now God invites us all, and God desires us all. But as someone said, God is enough of a gentleman that if we want our will, God in the end will say, then your will be done. Because as C.S. Lewis presents, there will be two types of people. Those who say, to God, thy will be done. And to whom God says, your will be done. So we are invited into this relationship with God. And that is the point of all of this traveling along. To get us closer, to be in relationship, to be with God so that we are in God's presence. This week while at conference, our bishop gave an excellent opening sermon. And, and I, I have to say, I expected it to be good. He is the bishop. It is conference, and it is the opening sermon. Right? Don't, don't you, wouldn't you expect a good sermon? And he, he gave an excellent sermon. And he started with this. We must remember to keep the main thing the main thing. We must remember to keep the main thing the main thing. And, and, and his point had to do with this. The main point of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. 
The main purpose that why we exist, what we're about, what we're supposed to be doing, is we are supposed to be bringing people into a relationship with Christ, so they become mature and that we move on and we become more and more into the likeness of Christ. And we are in Christ's presence. Our, our scripture today that is from 2 Corinthians, right? It's 2 Corinthians? It's good I remembered that part. We just read it. Was it 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians. That's the way they say it in Europe. For those who don't know, our, our President Donald Trump called it 2 Corinthians, and he took a little abuse for that one. It, in the United States, we say 2 Corinthians. So anyway, in 2 Corinthians, um, there is this point being made that this really isn't all about us. The story is really about Christ and that we are in the midst of dying. We are nothing but what? Clay vessels. And that in the end, the clay vessels, we don't, we die. I hope this isn't shocking news to anybody that we don't all get out of here alive. We, we, we must go through death to get to fullness of life. So, you know, I began thinking about this whole idea of clay vessels, and, I, and I've got some pictures today. Uh, the first one is what, how common clay vessels would be in the day. So just consider how common they were. Uh, as Paul spoke about, this is what clay vessels would look like. Uh, the modern translation of what a clay vessel would be is our second one here, Tupperware. <laughs> I want to present to you that you are nothing more than Tupperware, except for tup Doesn't that make you feel a lot better? I'm going to, you know, in, in our house, I, I eat the, almost the same cereal every morning. It's really kind of tragic. There's so many opportunities to eat other things, but I eat the same cereal every morning. And guess what? It is, I take it out of the box and I put it in a Tupperware thing and I can look and I, it doesn't have to have the label on it. Why? Because I can see it. Thank you. I can see right through it. And so the purpose is really what's in the package. The packaging, you know, I think we get a little bit too excited about packaging. We kind of over-package things today. i got to remember where my sermon's going. What's the next picture? It, it probably, oh, here's some packaging just gone wrong. Tastes like grandma. <laughs> the funny things you run across when you're Googling uh, badly done packaging. I think there's some apostrophe. Is there supposed to be an apostrophe and an S? For the, for the people who really know grammar, yeah, it tastes like grandma's jam. That's just not right. Uh, so you should get packaging right. Here's what happens when you overpackage. <laughs> Am I wrong, but don't bananas come with their own package? So we, we occasionally get a little overexcited. And as humans, do we ever overpackage? ourselves? Yeah, I, I don't need to go over that anymore. Okay. And then we have uh, uh, packaging is really about what's important on the inside. You do not want to mix these two products up. <laughs> One is flying insect killer and the other is canola spraying oil. It kind of got stretched out. They actually looked a whole lot like each other. Do not put these in your cabinet next to each other. I think that would make your eggs taste a little funny in the morning. <laughs> We probably ought to just go back to our, yeah, what's the point? <laughs> our, our author in, in 2 Corinthians is trying to tell us what is inside the vessel is really important. What is inside the vessel is really important. And as Christians, we need to remember that it's having God inside of us. By having Jesus in us, by having the Holy Spirit indwell in us, the more and more that we spend time with having those things in us, the more we are able to have them come out of us. The more we take in, the more we're able to take out. I, I could tell you as a, as a pastor, having done, uh, in, in, that we're in the midst of death, I have done enough funerals now to notice some trends in, in funerals. For those people who have spent very little time with God, with very little time with Jesus, it is apparent 
in their lives and in their deaths. And, and those who have spent an inordinate amount of time with Jesus, it is very apparent because it comes out in their everyday life. And, and when their funerals come around, they are much more a joyful celebration. There are two, have, have you ever noticed this? There are funerals that you leave and you are incredibly broken and downhearted from. And there are others we leave from and they are beautiful things. And I will tell you, I think this is the primary difference. How much were they filled with God? How much are we filled with God? The primary thing we need to be doing is being filled. Our second scripture from the book of Mark is really kind of an ironic piece here. Uh, and you may have missed the irony in it. I, I've missed it for quite a while. I, I find this particular part really interesting. The, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious teachers are out to trip Jesus up. Now, they had seen him before, if you read just a little bit before this, they were eating wheat in the field. So they were going along picking, and they got in trouble for that. And so they were curious, is Jesus going to do something else wrong on the Sabbath? So they invite him, and, and, and so you also have invited somebody who uh, has a disability. And then Jesus is presented with healing him. And so what does Jesus do? He asks him a question. Is it right to heal is it, is it right to do harm or to do good? Which is it? And they don't answer. Now, I'm going to give them a little bit of a break here uh, because Jesus could have waited till the next day to heal this man. He, he could have waited another day. He's probably had this problem for a while. Why not wait another day, Jesus? And, and I think Jesus is pushing this particular issue to say something. And, and it is something that really does upset the religious teachers, is by doing this on the Sabbath, he is saying, I am greater than the Sabbath. He, he's pushing them to understand that he is there to bring about not only wholeness, but also to push this idea that he is the Son of God. And as such, they see this as blasphemy. And they get rather upset. And, and if you'll notice, what do they then... They go away and they plan to kill Jesus. Now, here's the ironic part of it, is what are they upset about Jesus for? They're upset with Jesus because he was breaking the Sabbath rules. But the religious teachers, by planning a murder on the Sabbath, are breaking the Sabbath rules too. You see, I, I think what they were really worried about is control. I think they lost sight of what this was really all about. And in losing sight about what it was all about, what did they do? They wanted to grab control. And I can tell you, anytime we try to grab control, chaos ensues. Every time we try to make something happen or come out of our own will, then all of a sudden chaos comes out right behind that. And so what do they do? I go, you know what? We're more concerned about how this looks than what's on the inside. And so they grab for control and all of a sudden they miss two things at once. They miss Jesus in their presence and they lose the Sabbath. Both happen at the same time. They're in the very presence of God they also lose the Sabbath. Jesus came to make us whole, to make us healed, to make us understand what is important again. And the Sabbath was about those things as well. And as Jesus was replacing the Sabbath, they missed both being in his presence. Well, let me tell two stories uh, that came from if you, if you ever get to go to annual conference, there's business sessions. There's a lot of visiting with everybody you haven't seen for a while. Do we do that in church? So you, you catch up with everybody. You, you have some business sessions. But there's also a great number of sermons. So there is a sermon and worship and then a business session and then a devotional and then music and then a, and, and so this goes on. So I heard several sermons and, and this is two sections uh, out of two sermons. One was that first sermon by the bishop. Uh, on the first night that he was there, he got up and he spoke about, uh, this is his, I think, second year as bishop. So I think he got here about the same time I got here. I, that's right, because Bishop Ewey appointed me here and we got the new bishop. It all works out. 
So anyway, he was talking about that he had done something that was a mistake. He had overcommitted as bishop. Anybody in here ever overcommitted in life? Got too much going on, too many things going on, all this going on in your life. And in doing all these things, he had been traveling and he'd been going. And he was in a meeting uh, and he said it was the worst meeting he had ever been to in his life. To which makes me curious, okay. But he didn't give any more details. Just the worst meeting he had ever been into in his life. And then he just decided, he got up, he walked out of the meeting, caught a plane home, because he'd had enough. And he said, for no good reason. And I thought, because it's the worst meeting ever, that's a good enough reason for me. But, but for him, it was this place of running out of gas. Exhaustion and, and loss of purpose and all of these things came piling on. And he, and he came back and he said, you know, his, his first meeting back, B.T. Williams, did a devotional. And he read from the United Methodist book uh, that had to do with confirmation from the 1950s. And it, it started with this. The purpose of the church, the purpose of the church is that it is God's idea. And it is driven by God. And it is in God's care. And all of it will be done in God's time. So learn to rely on God. Do you see what he had forgotten? Do you, do you see what the temptation for all of us to forget is? That in this journey, that we take on all too much on ourselves. That God is with us and God will take us to where we need to go. That God invites us on this journey. Yet, I don't know about you, but I worry a little too much. I fret a little too much. And I don't pay attention to the right things. It is about one thing. On the second day, we had a lunch uh, for the Asbury graduates. I graduated from Asbury Seminary. And one of my professors was there speaking, uh, Professor Headley. Uh, really nice man from Africa. And he is pastoral care professor, uh, psychologist. And so he has written multiple books on pastoral care and what it is you need to do to keep from being burned out as a, as, as a pastor. I don't know if you know that happens, but the pastors burn out at an incredible rate. And it's happening a lot these days. And he's written multiple books on it. And so he, he was talking about, interestingly enough, the very next passage after we read in Mark. If you read the next verse, this is what he preached on. And, and as he preached on it, it was the calling of the 12 disciples. And it's really a list of names. And Jesus called, he went to a mountain and he called to himself and then it lists the disciples. And, and so then he preached on it. He goes, now this is a curious text to preach on. I thought, you sure is. Where are you going with this? And, and he, he, he pointed out that one of the most important things for us to always remember is that unless we remember to go to God, that we will all burn out. Unless we remember it really is about being filled with Jesus, we will lose heart and we will become downhearted. And, and here's what he pointed out. He says, I've read this text many times. I've written several books all around this whole thing. And he says, what I've, I finally read this, this week on it was, the first thing Jesus did was he called the disciples to be with him. Did you catch it? He called the disciples to be with him. Folks, our, our primary calling is to Jesus. Our primary calling is to God. We are invited to travel along with Jesus himself. As we come to communion today, as we come to partake with Jesus, we are invited to take him in so that we may have him with us and that he flows out of us into this world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.